Good to see everybody here uh, this morning and just wanted to start off with just a few thoughts with you. Um, in our society, we live and, and they had the same back then where we are constantly inundated with, um, with ideas, with, um, with uh, products, with different types of things, especially this last weekend. I mean, if you're like me, you find out really quickly of how many emails you subscribe to because you got like every single one from all these different companies, all these different brands. And I won't you know, share with you all of those, but um, when, you, when you realize all the different patterns and images and symbols, they all represent something. They all actually share with you either a product or an idea or it brings to memory of something very specific. It doesn't even necessarily have to have a name with it. It's very recognizable. And so I want us to kind of just a few uh, seconds this morning and I don't know how to work this thing, to be honest with you. Is there on? That's the first question. I couldn't find the on button, so do you have to hold it down? On the side, it's actually a manual button. Okay. I want to share a few images with you because I didn't want to inundate you with it, but I want you to immediately think, what do you think of when you see these images? This image, I didn't even know what it looked like, just to let you know on my you know, education background. Uh, so uh, I didn't, had no clue, but uh, obviously that's going to come to mind to a lot of you all. Another image that's going to mean a lot to a lot of you all, and it has a lot of meaning and a lot behind it. This one, once again, is going to give you a lot of different other thoughts, right? For those younger in this, you know, I, I, that's fine if they don't know. But So this invokes something very negative, very much uh, death, those that grew up around this. Once again, I didn't even have to post the fullness of this. This image, this one image by itself invokes exactly what it's meant to do and what it does. I think most of you all know this image, uh, but this image does it not actually speaks almost the opposite of the last two, right? So this is the Red Cross image and it started out with this idea of helping, healing, Those in the medical field, and, and, and a lot of us may recognize this, but this is the medical standard image that they use a lot of the times. I won't get too much into the history behind this image, but it's based on Greek mythology and uh, the idea of one of the Greeks that represents healing uh, the Greek gods, quote unquote. Um, but regardless, this image invokes the idea of medical healing. So in all of these so far, they either gave you an idea of, hey, there is a bond, you know, the Marines, there is a brotherhood, there is an ideology, there is a, a, a togetherness that it invokes. The National Honor Society, just that was the one that popped in my head, you have to qualify for that apparently. And you, you have this togetherness, you have this bond, there is an association with it, right? Then when I put the electric chair and the noose, it should have brought to mind death. It should have brought to mind that this is punishment. This is capital punishment. And then these other two images brought to mind medical or healing. You can see where different images are going to invoke different things. They don't even have to have any words to it. So I have one more image for us to ponder. And I want you all to think of all the different things that it comes to your mind.
So now us today in 2022, we may immediately look at this image and it will probably bring a lot of positives because we're all here together, gathered together. This is what we're to remember. But you got to keep in mind what we want to do today is I would like to go over a little bit of a history and go through scripture and actually take a look at this image. And I, I would say as we walk through this, that if you lived in the first century, this image is not positive. This image is going to invoke the same feelings that the electric chair and the noose would have invoked when you saw it. And in fact, I would argue after we get done studying this that it's actually worse of an image. It is so grotesque, so representative of, of exactly uh, what we would not want uh, to see or to be part of our family. But that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, the, uh, is talking about this cross or the idea of crucifixion, which is the style of capital punishment that was used. So, uh, so let's go ahead and move on and let's just take a look. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time this morning talking about the actual background a little bit. I found it intriguing, but it's going to have deep connections to what we're studying in the scriptures. And so I wanted to kind of go over that with you this morning. So I put up a lot of bullet points. That way you all can uh, kind of follow along. And I'm going to add a couple other different details. Um, but it was the method of penalty. Uh, and it was not created by the Romans. In fact, it was used and more than likely used in the Assyrians and the Babylonian empires. Uh, for sure, the Persians, uh, I think I have up there that the, the, the earliest known reference that they could concretely find is around 500 AD, uh, 500 BC, uh, which would put it around the time of the Persians. Uh, but apparently the Persians definitely are the ones that brought it brought it in even more to light. And um, they were the ones that introduced it also to um, the, uh, the Middle East. And so to, to give that idea of type of capital punishment. Um, it's also important to note that back then, even the Greek words and later on with the Latin words, this idea of crucifixion or based on the cross comes from this idea of capital punishment, has this idea of impaled on a stake or affixed to a tree. So even in their history, this idea of capital punishment, earlier stages would have had this idea of being impaled or affixed to a tree based on history. So I just wanted to kind of point that out as we walk through uh, when we take a look at this. If we look a little bit more into the Roman times, which that brings us to the, uh, the Latin language, and just the Latin word for cross is crux or Christus, and uh, this is what just the basic word cross means. Of course, the idea of crucifixion, which has that root word of cross in it, uh, is more of actually fixating a person on the cross for capital punishment with regards to that idea. Um, when we look at the background of the crucifixion or the crucifix, the crucifix would be a, a person on the cross representing the actual capital punishment. Um, it was used by the Romans for the most serious crimes. It was not for just every type of crime. It was also reserved for slaves, disgraced soldiers, foreigners, very rarely, very rarely, Roman citizens. So it was definitely something to really show for the outsiders. And it also included, of course, Christians. So Christians uh, would have been used for this. Of course, we know that through, through Jesus. The, it's interesting, I thought it was uh, the Phoenicians being brought into the, what we now call the Middle East, uh, the Persians introducing it. The Phoenicians is near like the tribe of Asher. So if you're looking where modern day uh, Lebanon is, and it's interesting to note that they're the ones that actually introduced the idea to the Romans, which I thought was intriguing 
to that. So the Romans used this, and they used it extremely well as a historian. So a lot of this stuff that I'm sharing with you is from history, not from any kind of Bible knowledge or study. This is based on history. That they perfected the art of crucifixion, the Romans did, by using, they used it for 500 years, all the way up until Constantine in the 4th century. And if you know your history, that may be, rings a bell with you, the idea that Constantine actually converted to Christianity, and he was the first uh, uh, emperor that actually uh, legalized Christianity in Rome, and that was in the 300s AD. So interesting to note that the, the one that has started to adopt Christianity is the one that actually stopped the actual crucifixion in Rome with regard, using that as a form of capital punishment. To be clear, the symbol of this, the actual uh, idea of what it was supposed to do and cause was full torture, suffering. Um, I wrote down suffocation, dehydration, shock. Death would take a lot of times up to six hours all the way through four days. The crucif This process would take. So the goal was not to kill you quickly. The goal was for you to suffer and to be a disgrace and be, to be shown. And of course, we've talked about that throughout different sermons. We definitely focus on this idea, but I just wanted to kind of mention that as the same. If we, we might even say the, the pain that he or anyone would go through is just excruciating, excruciating pain. And this word's an interesting word, and as I, as I put it up there, and you all will now see it now, I did not know this until I was studying this. But the, also, it kind of popped up in my news feed when some female super popular artist was watching her whole concert tour literally crumble before her eyes. She said that it was excruciating to watch. Now, that may be for her. But that word excruciating just popped right out at me. As I was studying for this, I noticed that excruciating, as you can see there, I have it up on the thing, X meaning out of, cruciating meaning the crucifixion. That's exactly what that word means. When you look it up, that's exactly where we get that word excruciating. Kind of makes me second guess whether to even use that word because a lot of times we use it, oh, I was in such excruciating pain. Really, was I? And it really puts a lot of weight into that word. And I thought that was interesting, just wanted to kind of mention that. But truly, excruciating pain is exactly what it means, which is from the cross. So there's some background on what it was designed to do. It was designed to completely not only disgrace the person that was going to be crucified, but it would even carry with it to their family. It would be a disgrace to their whole family. But it definitely was a negative symbol in the land with regards to that. So here's the question. We're going to walk through the scriptures to see how much emphasis does this put on for us. Was this just happened to be the mode of execution that Jesus was there for? Did it just so happen to be the first century? Is there something more to the cross that means something to us today? And so we will look at scriptures and take a look at that. The first scripture I wanted to look at is Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 through 23. And it says, If a man committed a crime punishable by death, and he was put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain nigh on the tree, but you shall bury him on the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord God, your God, is given you for an inheritance. If you hang him on a tree, it is cursed by God. And they had provisions. This is Deuteronomy when they're going over those things. This is an important reference because in this case, we actually now have revelation of what that actually means and the depth of this curse right here in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, starting in verse 10, to give it some context, it says... Uh, for all who rely on the works of the law are under the curse. 
the curse of sin is what he's referring to. For it is written, Cursed be to everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one be justified by the, by, uh, before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ, in verse 13, is the key point here. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He became and put on our sins and our transgressions, became the curse for us as it was written, and Paul then references Deuteronomy. Cursed is everyone who hung, hanged on a tree, so that in Christ the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So we see here this the connecting idea. And of course, we read about the original, the crucifixion also had this idea of affixing someone on a tree. And so not only does history point to this, but also the scriptures point to this, that this idea of hanging on the tree is ultimately going to be representing of what Christ did for us by becoming the curse and, uh, and actually blessing us through that. But also if we add just as a bonus, Isaiah 53, starting in verse 4, it continues this idea of him bearing our burdens and our sorrows. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet. Sorrows yet. We, we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. The chastisement here, the, the actual discipline or the actual judgment, because sin deserves what? What is the wages of sin? Romans 6.23 says it is death. And if any group of people understood what the actual penalty for sin was, it would be the Old Testament, the old law, the Israelites, because they dealt with it every year. They dealt with the sacrifices. They dealt with the blood. Death had to be in existence to have any kind of forgiveness or remission of sins sacrifice was necessary and so this was what Jesus became for us he bore our sorrows he carried our sorrows bore our griefs he became the judgment the penalty he actually paid it for us and that's what he's referring to there but now let's take a look and see how how does Jesus refer to the cross or about Jesus so interesting enough, I thought, is that we know a couple of these verses fairly well, so we're going to go ahead and run through them. In Matthew 10, in verse um, 34, he starts going through what were really popular. Now, do, do not think that I come to bring peace onto the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, and his daughter-in-law against his mother-in-law, and a person's enemy will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy me, and whoever loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy me. And then verse 38, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So if you have anything that you put before serving the Lord, then you're not worthy of him. And he's saying, so you need to take up your cross and follow me. If not, then you are not worthy of me. And then he continues to hammer at home with 39. Verse 39 says, whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so he's emphasizing here, even your own life, if you put before serving me, then you will end up losing it. And you must lose your life in order to actually find life, which is eternal life living through Christ. And then he continues in uh, Matthew 16 with a very similar statement. When Jesus, uh, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And then he repeats the similar statements there, whoever shall save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profits a man if he gains the whole world? And it continues on. Now, we're used to these verses, but uh, a really good friend of mine I was talking to the other day, a really good friend, we were having coffee together, and 
he was mentioning, I was talking to him about this passage in this sermon, um, and he, he brought up a really good point and shared with a commentary with me. The disciples listening to Jesus saying, you must take up your cross and follow me, had to have been a very confusing statement to them. It's not confusing to us because we have the big picture. We know where he's going. We know what he's doing. But for them back then, the cross-bearing meant only one thing to them. It meant disgrace. It meant that you are guilty of a grievous crime. It meant that you are the lowest of low. You are a foreigner. You're an outsider. You are disgraced. And that you are going to go through excruciating pain and all of this because you deserve it. Does that make sense? In other words, but for Jesus to say, take up your cross, because as we're going to see as it pertains to Jesus in this next verse, that that is what they did. And we study that quite a bit where the person was to take their cross take the beam and actually bear it as they go to be carried to be actually executed and so this idea of taking up your cross would have meant complete death in other words what jesus was asking them to do had to have been confusing to them at the time but we have that big picture we have that total picture and we can have confidence in that which is awesome so john 19 just to kind of read the account of jesus bearing his own cross and he delivered them over to be crucified so they took jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skulls which is in aramaic is called Golgotha, and they, 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 there they crucified him, him with two others, one on one either side, and, and Jesus between them. I would be remiss if I didn't mention 1 Peter 2. So if you turn to 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 21, Jesus bore the cross. He is giving us this example. And when we look at 1 Peter 2, verse 21, starting, it says, For to this you all have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Christ suffered. Christ was crucified. And we are to follow in his steps. He says he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself in him who just judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on a tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed, for we are, all, uh, we are restrained like sheep and have now returned to the shepherd, the overseer, of our souls so we see here jesus is our example and we are to bear the cross we are to bear the sufferings that's what we are called to do and that's what jesus is calling his followers is deny yourself take up his cross and follow him now after the crucifixion how does the cross reference how do the people talk about the cross and the crucifixion after jesus had died I had to just handpick. These are just a few. And in fact, some of the songs that we sang, and I appreciate Ed leading them, they even referenced other scriptures where I'm like, I could have put that scripture up here. So just bear in mind, this is a short list. But if you just Google, like Shane says, a very sophisticated effort, just put cross into your Bible gateway or to your search, and you'll see all the cross passages. But let me just review a few of them and highlight them. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17 and 18. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. There's power in the cross. There's power in the cross of Jesus Christ with regards to that. For the word of the cross is folly 
to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It is the power of God coming to the cross and talking about the cross. The words of the cross is the true power of God. It is part and parcel of who Christ is and what he did and what he became for us and how we are to equate that own caring of sorrow in our own lives. We are to come to the cross. Galatians 5 verse 11, but if I, brothers, still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. The cross is supposed to be offensive. It's supposed to be convicting. It's something we come to because that's where we lay our sins. That's where we die to ourselves. That's where our Savior came and became our salvation with regards to that and him overcoming the cross. Galatians 6, verses 12, and then also verse 14. It is those who will make, a, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who will force you to be circumcised in only order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So when we get persecuted, we're being persecuted for the cross of Christ. It is his image and his death and his death on the cross in which we stand strong and that we are persecuted in. And he continues there in verse 14, but far be it from me to boast or to glory or to rejoice except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I become dead. And that's when we look at that word and we see that connection. It is a powerful imagery and is purposeful by God that we have that imagery of the cross. Ephesians 2 verse 16, and might be reconciled us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So if you see, I'm highlighting these things, but it is the word of the cross. It's through the cross. And if you look at Philippians 3, verse 18, for many of whom I have been told to you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross. So when we have those on the outsiders, they're walking, they're, they're enemies of the cross. We are sojourners of the cross. We are champions of the cross. We are believers of the cross. We are to walk as cross bearers. We are bearing the cross and we are suffering and using Christ as our example with regards to that. Colossians 1 verse 20, and through him to be reconciled to himself to all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ, the saving and salvation through his blood of the cross is a connecting factor with regards to that. And in Colossians 2 verse 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, we demanded death. That death that was on the cross was set aside, nailing it to the cross so that we might live and put on Christ through the cross and the death that he required for us. I was going to put an image up here, but by denying oneself, taking up Jesus and following him, it's exactly what we do when we come to the cross and we are to die to ourselves. We are to crucify the old man and put on the new man. We are coming to the cross. We are coming to that mode and putting to death ourselves so that we might rise up and live through Christ Jesus. But we are gathered here today because it's only his overcoming of that death. It is only him doing that for us that we might even be able to boast, to rejoice, and to be here today and look at the image of the cross and not look at it as a sad image, but one that is sad, but we also can rejoice and we can boast in with regards to that. And the last verse that I thought was fitting that I want us to, to leave us with, really, as we conclude, is Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 12 and um, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus took what meant death 
and made it life. Jesus took what represented a disgrace and made us worthy. Jesus took what represents um, a spectacle for society. He says, we're going to be a light to society. He took the cross and the crucifixion, and what man meant it for bad, God meant it for good. And we can come to the cross knowing that this means healing, this means salvation, this means truth, this means everything. So not only are we Christians, not only are we followers of Christ, but we're followers of the cross, and we are to represent that, and we are to show the world um, the cross. Um, and when we read these songs about coming to the cross, I'm sure Ed had a bunch to pick from. I was going to pull up songs, but then I got drowned in that. I got drowned in the scriptures. But I hope that this was encouraging for you as we uh, prepare the communion and think about these things. We can think about that great sacrifice that he gave for us and be thankful for the cross that he bore for our sins.